People often draw comparisons between video games and films, mainly due to the cinematic presentations of games such as Uncharted and the waking nightmares that Quantic Dream creates. However, games may actually be closer to books than people realise. Like books, their length allows for more world building and their hands-on nature allows for a more personalised experience as well as an ability for the audience to dictate the pacing. Certainly one could argue that if they were really so similar we'd be swimming in book-to-game adaptations, but it does happen, not quite enough for swimming, but that's probably for the best. Can you imagine the paper cuts? Come on. Anyway, I'm going to spotlight ten of them now and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Before we begin, a few ground rules. Firstly, we are only counting games based on books rather than games inspired by books, therefore Bioshock, Assassin's Creed and Spec Ops The Line don't count. Also, we're not looking at games based on movies that were based on books, so that's a no to Harry Potter on the PS1 because I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be Robbie Coltrane playing Hagrid and not a child's drawing of a god goblin on a wonky egg. Anyway, let's get literate. I'm Ben from Triple Jump, and here are 10 video games based on books. Number 10. Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six the late Tom Clancy has had, and is still having, his name put on a multitude of games, almost always by Ubisoft. Series include The Division, Splinter Cell, Ghost Recon, and Rainbow Six. While Clancy was an author, the truth is that few of the games bearing his name are actually based on his novels. The original Rainbow Six was released in 1998, and after that, only a few of the games in the series stuck to his writings before heading off on their own path. The other three major Clancy game franchises didn't even partially follow the author work. Prior to Rainbow Six, though, there were a number of Tom Clancy games that stayed true to his books. Ruthless.com, SSN, The Cardinal of the Kremlin, and a load of Hunt for Red October games were all based on Clancy's books, yet almost none of the Ubisoft games are. Strange move, tying your name to the star power of an author who had little or nothing to do with them. Number 9. Parasite Eve Parasite Eve is not a direct adaptation of the novel of the same name, but is rather a sort of detached semi-sequel. It's considered non-canon, author Hideaki Sinao was not involved with the game, but the book does provide the backstory for Square's 1998 horror RPG and offers a lot more context for those who read it before playing. Also apologies to the author for butchering your name there. Gameplay-wise, it's a blend of real-time and turn-based combat. Think of it like its compatriot, Final Fantasy VII, only here you can shuffle around a bit while waiting for your attack to recharge. Speaking of Final Fantasy VII, Parasite Eve may have been held in higher regard today if not for the vastly more more popular and critically acclaimed game releasing shortly before it. It even drew unfavourable comparisons to Resident Evil, which released a couple of years prior. Man, the late 90s were truly great for PlayStation fans, weren't they? Parasite Eve is a gem of the era and has devoted fans to this day. Even those who missed out on the experience back in 1998 likely know of its iconic and controversial intro scene in which an audience spontaneously combusts at an opera. It's gorgeous and unforgettable in spite of the expected PS1 gem or maybe because of it. Number 8. I have no mouth, and I must scream. I'll not go into too much detail about the plot of Harlan Ellison's 1967 short story I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream because it is quite possibly the most depressing sci-fi tale of all time. And frankly, I'm worried that if I do go into details, Cultaholic's Tom Campbell could end up seeing this video, and I don't think I could cope if I broke the bastion of positivity's optimism. So let's just smile and get through this with a can-do attitude, shall we? The story itself is set after an apocalypse caused by a man-made vengeful AI. I, though vengeful may be putting it mildly. No, nope, I'm not getting into it. This is a happy channel. Let's move on. In the video game adaptation, released 28 years after the book's publication, Ellison himself starred as the antagonist A.M. He also co-wrote the extended script for the game, despite the fact he didn't play games or even own a computer. What a hero. Critics loved this point-and-click adventure in 1995, though it didn't sell particularly well. If you enjoy the Monkey Island games but wish they were considerably more depressing, then be sure to give it a go. Just don't tell Tom. Number 7. William Shatner's Tech War Ah, oh, Shatner. Musical pioneer, acting supernova, writing maestro, hold on, the books were all ghost-written? And Rocket Man is a cover? Elton who? Well, this changes everything. He was still a great actor though, right? Oh. The Tech War series of novels began in 1989. It was based on the concepts Shatner created, 
sort of, ghostwritten by Ron Goulart, with his name pronunciation butchered by me. The novels released at a rapid clip, sometimes even twice in a year. I hope Shatner was paying overtime for that level of output. The game itself was like most games released around 1995, that is to say, it was a Doom clone. There was video footage of the Shat himself narrating, providing spectacular acting, and well, that's about it. It's a slower, worse version of Doom, but with Star Trek Man, who could ask for anything more? Number 6. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Remember when video games were just words? Of course you don't. Nobody who was around back then is still alive. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, based on the Douglas Adams novel of the same name, was one of these games. No graphics, no animation, just a prompt and some text. What luck that it was based on a book full of great text, eh? God. The plot follows the book fairly faithfully. It hits the same narrative beats and features the same characters, only with extra dialogue written by Adams specifically for the game. And yes, we know Hitchhikers was originally a radio serial before it was novelised, but this game is based on the book. I know that because they both require me to read them. For any fans who may have missed out on this silly and often painfully obtuse game, there's a free version of the 30th anniversary edition available on the BBC website right now. Might as well return your PS5, really. Number 5. Metro 2033. Surprisingly, we had multiple options when it came to the post-apocalyptic hellscape based on bleak Russian literature and developed by a Ukrainian studio category. We've opted to spotlight the Metro series, but that other one is pretty good too. Based on the novel of the same name by Dmitry Glukovsky, whose name I've almost certainly ruined, Metro 2033 is set in a version of Moscow in which desperate survivors attempt to carve out a life underground. Picture Fallout, only a lot bleaker with at least 45% more Nazis and Communists and around 37% fewer graphical bugs. And yes, that does still mean it's very buggy. Metro 2033 more than makes up for it though in atmosphere and world building. Considering how much it looks like a basic first person shooter, the heavy themes, ethical dilemmas and RPG elements all all come together to elevate it into an admirable work of art in its own right. Number 4. Betrayal at Krondor Based on the Rift War series of books by Raymond E. Feist, Betrayal at Krondor holds a special place on this list. Not only is it based on books, but it was also designed to play like one. The main story progresses in chapters written on the pages of a musty old hardback. In a way, Betrayal at Krondor is the most booky adaptation of all book adaptations. It was also influential. Predating the Elder Scrolls arena and coming just a year after Ultima Underworld, Betrayal at Krondor was one of the defining games that helped establish the first-person sandbox RPG. The game was also itself adapted into a novel, written five years afterwards by original author Feist himself. It was called Krondor the Betrayal, which is about as imaginative a name as Ekins from Pokemon. I thought you authors were supposed to be creative, frauds, the lot of you. Number 3. Lord of the Rings The Fellowship of the Ring You may remember the tremendous movie tie-in games from EA that released alongside the Lord of the Rings films in the early 2000s, but did you remember that the first of those tie-ins was actually The Two Towers? It can be an easy thing to forget. It's even easier to forget that there was a Fellowship of the Ring game that appeared around a year after the movie, which had no connection to the Peter Jackson films at all. This is because Vivendi had the license for book adaptations only, while EA held the license for only the film adaptations. That's why EA's The Lord of the Rings Battle for Middle-earth 2, like other EA games that had nothing to do with the films, used the character models based on the movies. It meant they could claim that they weren't breaking their license agreement by adapting something other than the films. I assume that's the case anyway. I'm not a lawyer. Yet. With Vivendi only being able to adapt the novels, they produced the Fellowship of the Ring and The Hobbit. Are they good? Not really, but if you're wanting to avoid the Jackson movie tie-ins for some reason, you've got those, the 80s text adventures and the rubbish SNES one, so pick your poison. Number 2. The Dark Eye Back in the 90s, gaming was trying to figure out both what it was and what it could be. It was in a sort of rebellious teen phase. The industry was evolving past the era of 2D platformers and side-scrolling shooters, but 3D was still in its infancy. These uncertain years gave rise to some, shall we say, experimental games. The Neverhood, Vib Ribbon, Seaman, Mist, Oddworld, and FMV games such as Night Trap all attempted something new to varying success. The Dark Eye was certainly one of them. It was a claymation game based on the short stories and poems of Edgar Allan Poe. 
Poe. You know, the chap who wrote the first Simpsons Halloween episode. I joke, of course, he only wrote the third story. I always wondered why he didn't write any more cartoons after that. He clearly had a gift for them. Anyway, the Dark Eye isn't much of a game, it's more of an experience. You play through various Poe stories from the perspective of either the murderer or the victim. The main selling point, and why it deserves some more attention, is that it's a genuinely unsettling experience. The handmade claymation is both uncanny and fascinatingly grotesque. And yes, I know I said the same thing about the California raisins, but I'm right on both counts. Number one. The Witcher series. In what is possibly the most famous book adaptation, the Witcher series needs no explanation. But seriously, what can you say about CD Projekt Red's seminal RPGs that hasn't already been said? The third installment in particular has garnered Skyrim-esque levels of both adoration and saturation. We'll surely be playing it on our smart wine cabinets any day now. Based on the novels by Polish author Andrzej Sapkowski, the Witcher series has single-handedly made CDPR into the behemoths of the industry that they are today. The books in the games each have have their own continuity, but the games draw so thoroughly, faithfully, and lovingly from Sapkowski's writings that there's no question he deserves much of the credit for the game's engaging world and characters. All but one of Sapkowski's Witcher books were published during the 1990s, including two short story anthologies and the five novels that make up the main saga. In 2013, after a 14-year break, he also published a standalone Witcher novel called Season of Storms. While they have always had a ravenous following in Poland, it wasn't until the first game was released in 2007 that any of the books received an English translation. We wouldn't have the game without the books, of course, but many of us wouldn't have the books without the games either. That's oddly satisfying. However, not as satisfying as the fact that I made it through the entire entry without mentioning Cyberpunk. Oh, damn it. 